Yes, major speeches, two uh, com two um, events here in Harvard today, and written two columns and moved one city. And my plane, this is America, was an hour and a half late. Your av aviation system really is a joke. It makes it makes Britain look functional. So. Uh, I am very tired, and I got up very early in the morning to write my last column, or this column, which was on zombie ideas about Brexit, um, which I particularly enjoyed writing, but it was very early. So I am very tired, and I have no idea whether I will be co coherent. <laughs> to save myself from total incoherence, I have a presentation, which always helps. Uh, and what I'm going to do, there are so many different crises in Europe. Um, there's the migration crisis, uh, there's uh, the mess we have with our neighbor to the east, there's the mess we have uh, uh, with our big neighbor to the west, namely you, and we have, um, of course, Britain's mess and then the Eurozone recovery and the future of Europe on many dimensions. And I am just going to focus on two things in my half hour. The first is what's happened to the Eurozone and how far we can say that it has survived uh, the crisis. Uh, and the second, which will probably be a little bit shorter, is where we are in the Brexit story and what might happen. I'm very happy to talk about my views on you know, how we got here with Brexit and all the rest of it, but that would be a, a very, very long conversation, which I don't have the time for, and perhaps doesn't really matter anymore unless you're uh, interested in the archaeology of disasters. So um, uh, basically, my view is, you know, the Eurozone definitely had a near-death experience, I think, in 2012. It, 2030, it was pretty close to a goner. Um, at least I rated the chances then of a smash at 50-50. That doesn't mean I was right. I think there were um, four things that happened more successfully than I expected. <coughs> First, the European Central Bank, in my view, did its job. In the views of others, became the most incompetent, irresponsible central bank in the history history of the world, except of course for the Bank of Japan and the Fed and the Federal Reserve, and therefore uh, uh, has created the destruction of Europe. But anyway, I think it did its job as a central bank. The second thing, which I think is immeasurably important in preserving the eurozone, uh, is that there is no escape from this damn thing. And I wrote quite a bit about that. Uh, I've written a lot about that in my book called The Shifts and the Shocks. This really is a sort of one-way trap. Not that it's impossible to leave. It's always possible to leave. But any process of leaving is an enormous mess. And so only truly desperate governments will contemplate it. And to my surprise, even Tsipras was not desperate enough. Um, the third is that, to a remarkable degree, governments have been convinced that they should make certain sorts of reforms, particularly to their labor markets, and they have managed to carry through those reforms. And in some cases, I don't have time to go through the detail. Um, Spain is the most obvious one. They've been rather successful. And then finally, there was quite a successful process of adjust macroeconomic adjustment which shifted quite a bit of the problem to the rest of the world. Um, and uh, successfully, more successfully than I thought. Nonetheless, there remain some very considerable vulnerabilities and the debate on further reform is very difficult. In fact, I think it's sort of going to, going to be impossible. But I think if I remember correctly when I did this presentation, and if not, I'll do it anyway, um, I'm going to say a little bit about the sort of Macron-Merkel debate on what might happen. So um, I think this shows about as clearly as possible as I could find in a simple chart what happened uh, to uh, the Eurozone um, in the crisis. So I start in 2007. These are annual figures. They're GDP per head. So the Eurozone, I've aggregated the whole lot. Um, and it shows, shows what you know. Uh, there was a very big financial, a big crisis in 2008, 
uh, which hit actually US and Eurozone very similarly on a per habit basis. There was then a recovery for a couple of years to 2011, and then the Eurozone had a second crisis. So it had two distinct crises, um, the, the global crisis and the Eurozone crisis. The latter bottomed out in 2013, and since then, growth of GDP per head in the Eurozone has tracked growth in GDP per head in the US rather w remarkably well. It's slightly above the pre-crisis level, so uh, I think it can be precisely defined as 10 lost years. That's what's happened. The GDP per head is the same as it was uh, 10 years earlier. And uh, the growth rate is very slow, but in GDP per head terms, it's much the same as the US, since population growth is about a half a percentage point slower. If I remember, that means when the US is growing about two, the Eurozone is growing about one and a half. This is above sustainable rates of growth, um, as I'll show you later. Uh, well, in fact, I'm gonna show you here. Um, so this is what happened to unemployment. The Eurozone as a whole, there are very large regional differences, country differences, I should say, uh, was a relatively high unemployment zone before the crisis. It reached a trough of just over 7% in, in 2007. Um, that's because there are some high unemployment countries, uh, basically Southern Europe, um, most important of the big ones, France, but also Italy, and to a much lesser extent, Italy had, Spain actually, Italy too had high unemployment consistently, but Spain's unemployment fell to very low levels before the crisis because of the scale of its construction boom. It then shot up again in the two crises, you can see very clearly it reached a peak of 12%, but it's actually been falling quite smartly over the last three years or so, and is now down to 9%, um, is the natural quote unquote rate of unemployment below where it was before with the reforms maybe. Uh, if you are optimistic that unemployment in the Eurozone might be able to go to 6% because of reforms, possible. Uh, um, that means a huge improvement in France and Italy mainly. Germany is clearly at full employment by most standards. Um, then you've got a, maybe two, three more years of growth at above trend, and then it goes back to trend, which is just a fraction over 1% um, uh, in GDP uh, per head, possibly not even much over 1%. The monetary policy, uh, I could give you many charts on this, of course. Um, uh, I haven't put in, I got rid of the chart which shows the expansion of the balance sheet. The expansion of the Eurozone balance sheet, by the way, since before the crisis to now, the increase is much the same as for the Fed and the Bank of England, but from a higher level. It had a bigger balance sheet to start off with. One of the characteristics of the ECB, which I'm sure Hans Helmut Kotz could explain in great detail, is that a number of the central banks tended to have relatively large monetary liabilities um, in normal times, which I think is actually very sensible, but that's another issue altogether. The uh, so the Eurozone, the ECB had relatively low interest rates in the years up to the crisis. It had a rather accommodative policy, which showed up, I think, in the great Spanish boom and the Irish boom. Uh, with the, the rates of interest were clearly too low for those countries and supported massive construction come banking booms. Um, that wasn't true for Italy or um, Portugal, which are different cases, and Greece just went crazy. So the... Uh, we'll go into the detail of that. Um, monetary policy in the ECB eased quite rapidly. It didn't ease as much as in the other central banks you can see here. Uh, and then there was this very extraordinary episode, which I think triggered the crisis when Jean-Claude Trichet, for reasons that I really didn't understand at the time, decided it was very important to raise interest rates, uh, uh, which he started doing. And that was a signal to the markets, I think, that monetary policy was going to be very, really quite tough. And it triggered, along with the Greek crisis and the Portuguese crisis, a real run on Spanish and Italian bonds. And that was the crisis that, that Mario Draghi inherited. 
and which he had to deal with. Uh, one I wrote about once Italian bonds started yielding 7% and the Spanish, I think, was 65 I got the figures later. Um, with inflation falling below 2 so you've got in real interest rates of 4 or 5% in countries in deep depression or stagnation. It was with, uh, particularly with Italy, with its high debt, debt, the dynamics were just unspeakable. So it was obvious something had to be done. Either they had to default or they had to get the interest rates down. They did that very quickly. They moved into QE, as you know, and that has been successful. But they are not following the Fed yet. Uh, interest rates, are, depending on which you use, there are negative rates and near zero rates. Um, and it'll be an interesting question to see how quickly it will be normalized and what normalization will mean. Nobody yet knows. But when I discuss that, I always like putting this chart on because it reminds people who don't know, most of you I'm sure do know, that the Bank of Japan has offered near zero rates for 23 years. And in addition to that, enormous expansion of the balance sheet, which is on the way to being 100% of GDP. Uh, fairly soon, the Bank of Japan will own pretty well all the JGBs. And the only problem the Bank of Japan has had after 23 years of pretty near free money is it can't get inflation above zero. This is an interesting world, isn't it? Um, so this is what's happened to the yield on long-term bonds. Uh, I haven't put in Spain because Italy is enough, but you can see very, very clearly the crisis years in Italy and how severe they were in terms of very long-term interest rates. There weren't that many bonds outstanding, but you get the same picture for 10 years. Um, now, pretty obviously, Italy cannot fund its debt, which is about 130% of GDP now, at 5% uh, or 5.5% 5 .5 real, with an economy whose trend growth on a good day is half a percent for very long. So that was default territory, and everybody knew it. And um, I tended to assume that if the Italian government was pushed to default, it would leave the euro. That's an interesting political question. Lots of people disagreed. Um, and who knows, it would have been a very impressive political and economic mess. In any case, that's not what happened. They did normalize as a result of pushing out Berlusconi, getting some forms done by Mario Monti uh, and the ECB's policies. And of course, the, the uh, QE has helped because the Banca d'Italia has ended up buying a lot of bonds, which is, of course, very profitable for the Banca d'Italia and therefore very helpful for the finances of the government of Italy. There's nothing like seniorage, and there's lots of seniorage in this system. Um, I d the other reason to put this chart up, you see Italy's there yielding at 30 years more or less exactly what US is. So you might well think that's pretty peculiar, and I think you'd be right. So this is not, I think, a stable situation in the long run. Um, but the 30-year rates are unbelievably low. We are in a world of just unbelievably low long-term interest rates. If you believe the ECB is going to hit its inflation target, then Germany can borrow for 30 years at minus 1% real. Um, which I must say, um, uh, Hans Helmut can comment to that, really does make me wonder why they're so frightened of public debt. But there we are, go figure. Um, I mentioned the external adjustment. I think it's important to understand the external dimension of adjustment. I haven't got the time to go through the domestic side. So this basically shows what happened to the current account balances. I don't know whether account is lowercase, I, I, small case. I have no idea. Really weird. Anyway, um, so this is the aggregate balance of payments of the Eurozone uh, current account. The blue line is the Eurozone's current account balance. So back in 2008, they had a deficit of minus one, and about now they're peaking at a surplus of close to four. So it's a very big swing. It's a 5% of GDP swing by the world's second largest economy. The Eurozone is still bigger than China, uh, though it won't be for much longer. The, um, uh, we all know that in the run-up to the crisis, they were close to balance with enormous surplus in Germany, and the other creditors, basically the other creditors, was almost entirely the Netherlands. And then the, there were these very large deficits hit by the crisis hit countries, uh, um, the PIIGS countries, 
as we all know, uh, Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece, and Spain. And the dominant element in the scale of that deficit was Spain, which had a 10% of GDP current account deficit driven by this simply spectacular capital inflow to support a monstrous construction boom. I think it, construction peaked at 13% of GDP in Spain, which isn't far short of China. I mean, it's really a spectacular construction boom. This collapse, and that collapse is the main reason Spain had this enormous recession, which it did. To, uh, lost about 10 or 11% of GDP pretty quickly. And what is impressive is all these countries have moved into balance. I think today, France, I haven't looked at the very latest figures, France is the only country in the Eurozone with a current account deficit, and it's very small. And this driving everybody into surplus through contraction of domestic demand relative to output, disabsorption, in the technical term, um, has allowed the Eurozone to shift massively into surplus and that supported demand in a very significant uh, way in the Eurozone. So real domestic demand or spending, if you go back to my GDP, has been significantly weaker than real uh, GDP. GDP has recovered much better than real demand, or which is, of course, levels of domestic spending or absorption. Um, um, the I did have charts on private debt, but I got rid of them because just of lack of time, and even as I'm doing, I'm not doing very well here. Um, so that was the adjustment phase. The crisis had really quite dramatic effects on public debt. So this is net public debt in the Eurozone. Germany was hardly affected by the crisis. It's continued on down. And it, the IMF forecasts German net public debt at well under 40% by 2022. Will that happen? I have no idea. Um, uh, Spain and Ireland are two quite fascinating cases because uh, contrary to the sort of general story that has been told, was told during the crisis, they had very comfortable fiscal positions before the crisis. They, their problem was in the private sector with this huge uh, financial sector-driven housing boom, which we've already discussed, financed in significant measure abroad by, by foolish lenders. Uh, they then had, so they went into the crisis with net public debt of around 20% or less. They had immense explosions of fiscal deficits as they went into crisis. Uh, their economies contracted massively and uh, net public debt expanded by about 70 percentage points in uh, Spain and about uh, uh, much the same, some 60 or 70 percentage points in just a few years. Um, because of these deficits, uh, that was prevented them from going into far deeper recessions. If they had to prevent those fiscal deficits from happening, the, their crises would have been far more severe. Their economies would have contracted far more. And in my view, again, they would have left the Eurozone. It would have been impossible to cope with. But I don't know. Uh, but the impressive thing is that they were given the support by the central bank and other mechanisms of support. I should have mentioned earlier the European uh, financial stability uh, mechanism, which became the European stability mechanism. Um, FSF, wasn't it? Um, fund, European Financial Stability Fund, so that we also supported them. And But the, Euro, the ECB was crucial through its automatic financing through um, the so-called target system and its monetary policies. And they got through the crisis and Ireland and Spain have, Ireland particularly has had a dramatic recovery and its debt has come down again a great deal, which is a remarkable process of adjustment. And in the case of Spain, it's sort of limping down. It's very small. Italy, as you can see, started off high. It rose much more slowly and it's falling, forecast to fall very slowly. It remains very high. Portugal is essentially um, a case which started moderately high, shot up, and it's forecast to fall very, very slowly. So Italy and Portugal still have very high net public debt. And if they're expected to get that down, that's a long, long period of very small deficits or surpluses. And uh, France, you can see, is also uh, shot up quite a bit, but not to a high level. So generally, the crisis has lended, ended up 
with economies with very relatively high debt levels compared with the pre-crisis level, and the main cause of that was clearly the crisis. Um, uh, an important factor about the manageability of this debt is the relationship between um, the growth of nominal GDP and the the bond yield, the government bond yield. It obviously helps a great deal if nominal GDP is growing faster than nominal. Uh, the bond yield, it makes it much easier to grow out of debt. And one of the achievements of policy, both monetary and fiscal, is that for the countries I have here, which include the major Europeans, France, Germany, Italy, and Spain, these ratios are all positive. So we've moved to a period now from away from the um, the earlier period of about 2012. And now what we are seeing is that nominal GDP in all these countries, because they've got a decent recovery, is now growing as fast as or significantly faster than the yield on 10-year government bonds. On average, I've taken the average bond yield over the year and the on these 10-year bonds. And that makes life more difficult. The country which has the most difficult dynamic in that regard is still Italy. And the main reason is Italy's growth is so slow. So nominal GDP is still only growing a little bit north of 3%. It's still very, very slow. But we've got to much closer to manageability. The debt is now stabilizing and slowly, slowly falling as the crisis fades. This is what's happened to GDP per head. It's really comparable to the chart I showed earlier for individual countries. I've got the US in again. You've seen that before. Um, the country at the top is Germany. No great surprises about that. I've focused on the large countries. Um, you've got the dark blue is Japan. Um, the US is with it. The US and Japan are fairly close. France has been stagnant and is now finally beginning to recover. Uh, the UK is uh, had a moderately decent recovery, now stabilizing out, and the next year will be clearly much worse. Uh, the most striking cases are, I think, uh, Spain and Italy. Um, first, they had extremely deep recessions, with GDP per head falling by 11% in Spain and about 13% in Italy. But the really striking thing is the divergence in their subsequent outcomes. Spain has had a dramatically strong recovery with GDP per head returning to pre-crisis levels. It's still a, a lot, 10 wasted years, 10 lost years in GDP per head down, but they're back to where they were at the beginning. But at the current rate of growth, Italy is going to take to the second half of the 2020s before it gets back to where it was before the crisis. Um, and that itself is very little above where it was in 1990. Basically, Italy is, to all intents and purposes, X growth at the moment, has, is not growing, is not a growing economy anymore. And the politics of that and the social impact of that are going to be fascinating to see. And this is GDP per head, remember, so it allows for the fact that, of course, population growth is negligible, is zero. Um, this is what's happened to the unemployment of major European countries. So I've looked at the aggregate, Germany. I, I think it's worth going back to point out something I often point out, which is that since the crisis, which is 2007, GDP per head in Germany has risen 20% against Italy's GDP per head. That's just 10 years. That's an incredible divergence in economic performance within the Eurozone. This has clearly, whatever else it's been, not been a convergence process. It's been a massive divergence process. If I had Greece in there, it would make everything look, um, uh, sorry, um, look very weird because it would be um, um, somewhere, it would trough at about 75 and limping tinily back. Um, so it just makes everything else look very weird. Um, that's the unemployment rates. Italy has had very high unemployment. It is now falling. France is falling very slowly, to, but also falling. Um, you've got Germany's unemployment performance, which has been sensational and hardly affected by the crisis at all. And the UK, the one thing the UK economy has been doing very well is on unemployment, at least until recently. France and Italy have really big structural problems. Now, Italy's unemployment was much, much lower 
in 2006. So you could be optimistic if things go really, really well, they can get back to where they were in 2006, and then they could get unemployment down to 6% or so. That could give Italy, if they manage it, uh, several years, quite a long time of, of, of above trend growth. That, that's what everybody has to pray for, that the reforms have been strong enough to deliver that. And the same applies to France to a lesser degree. A crucial question, obviously, is how successful has monetary policy been in terms of managing um, its main target, which is inflation. I tend to focus on core inflation because uh, energy, food, particularly energy uh, prices are so unstable. Um, and this makes the point which everybody knows, that which is that since 2009, the Eurozone, the ECB has failed to get core inflation close to target. So, uh, so e inflation has been at running in the last few years at about 1%. It's still well below uh, any reasonable set measure of the objective. So you could say the ECB has failed to deliver what it set as its um, aim, which is close to but below 2%. <clears throat> but of course, that's headline and which is slightly different from this. But I think what we can say is, I, this is my view, they have, there is no urgency whatsoever in tightening monetary policy in the, Euro, in the Eurozone because they're still getting nowhere near their overall objective. And if they could, it would make the residual adjustment processes of com competitiveness within the Eurozone much easier. Uh, finally, um, let's just look at growth forecasts for 2018. And um, you can see that the whole Eurozone is now growing strongly. It's consistent with what we've seen earlier. Uh, the Germany is growing strongly. We're more optimistic about the consensus forecast is more optimistic about the Eurozone economies than they were in January of 2000, of, uh, January of this year. This compares the consensus in January with the consensus now in September. And there's been particularly dramatic improvements for Spain. Um, uh, which, as we indicated, has been having a remarkably strong recovery. What impact the Catalan crisis will have on Spain, Spanish economy, we don't know. I think it's a very, very interesting question. So, wait a second. Why isn't it moving forward? Uh, ah. So, um, so my conclusion from all this is that through various mechanisms, and time and patience and a willingness of politicians to take the strain and the willing of societies to do so. The Eurozone is recovering. It's recovering quite generally. Unemployment is falling. Public debt is stabilized and falling. Uh, the central bank feels it's in control of events, sort of, uh, which is wonderful from their point of view. The banking sector, which I haven't discussed, is generally believed to be considerably healthier than it was. There have been improvements in uh, in stabilization, in um, supervision of banking by moving uh, the supervisory mechanisms to Fa Frankfurt. They've created the European Stability Mechanism, which is very proud of itself. I just saw the head of this institution very recently in Brussels, and they've they feel that they're a much more effective institution than the International Monetary Fund. They expect to be turned into a European Monetary Fund. I'm going to come to this in a second. And all in all, it's a great success. Okay, so that's the, the view. And I have to say that I think it's been a major uh, crisis and disaster, the number of years wasted and lost. Uh, but I have to admit they come through this better than I expected them, them to at various points when I thought it would bust apart. So I've come to the view that the political will to make this thing work is strong enough, and I've written this many times over the years, uh, and the willingness to survive the shocks is strong enough that um, uh, it probably makes not much sense to bet against it. Now, a more interesting question might then be, if you accept that, it's going to be around. And of course, events in the outside world, Brexit, Trump, Russia, so forth, all make it even more de important for these countries to stick together because what else have they got? So they will. The question is, what's going to happen? Uh, um, 
uh, but in the terms of redesigning the eurozone. I'm not going to talk about wider security issues. Um, uh, as always in these debates, uh, Germany and France as the leading powers and with the France, which is a much more dynamic and intellectually coherent president than it has had for quite a long time, um, which isn't, I think, saying very much, the, uh, they have very different views about what... They both agree that the Eurozone should be reformed, but they, they, what they think mean by reform is entirely different. The, 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 the French view is it should be uh, more centralised, more centralised in terms of its instruments, uh, uh, there should be more automatic fiscal support, um, both for sh crisis hit countries and for the banking sector, and uh, and the uh, the German view pretty clearly is uh, what we mean by reform is more discipline, more um, guarantees that money will not go to irresponsible governments. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, certainly no transfer union, quote, unquote, nothing that looks like a fiscal transfer can be permitted uh, in any form. Uh, is there uh, a um, the possibility of reaching an intersection between these two things? Um, I think as far as the uh, Angela Merkel is concerned, as I understand it, um, and the CDU, at least under her, is the, the idea of turning the European stability mechanism, as it has now been created, into a European monetary fund to perform the functions of a European, of a monetary fund, overseeing governments, all the rest of it, um, lending to them very conditionally, but and therefore removing the IMF from the scene, would be moderately attractive to this part of the German government. However, uh, so that's an intersection. <coughs> Um, if completing the banking union means a shared deposit, uh, a deposit fund, my understanding at the moment is the Germans would find that almost impossible to accept. I'll be interested to see whether Hans Helmut thinks that differently. Um, and large-scale fiscal, you know, when Ma Mr. Macron talked about some sort of fiscal policy that would be macro-stabilizing for the Eurozone, um, that seems to me it implies a Eurozone budget of substantial size, and the, the chances of getting that agreed by the Germans seems to me to be very, very small. From what, yes, very, very small, which is my way of saying nothing. Um, so it looked to me when I spoke in Germany, I've been in Germany recently, that the European Monetary Fund was the one idea that might fly. But my understanding that is uh, that the FDP is opposed to this. The FDP, the Liberals, uh, are the likely, one of the two likely coalition partners, and it is generally expected that they will take over the, uh, the, uh, the finance ministry. So if that's true, Germany will become super hawkish, much more hawkish than it's been before, because they're going to be to the right of Wolfgang Schäuble on these issues. And they won't even be able to give that, which means that they're going to be able to give Mr. Macron nothing in economics. And so if he's going to get anything, it'll be in some other area like common security policy or something like that, which might be more plausible than, so maybe a European army is a more plausible proposition than, than a European monetary fund. That's sort of what I tend to think at the moment. I'll be very interested to see what others think. But in the moment anyway, the new emergent German government with a weakened Angela Merkel is not in a position to domestically, in my reading, to give anything very much, even to someone as attractive, intelligent, reasonable as Monsieur Macron, and certainly not until he's done lots and lots of reform and shown that they work. Um, or as I put it, the Germans will be very happy to reform Europe in the direction the French want when France has become Germany, but when France has become Germany, it won't want any of these changes, so it will no longer be relevant. So. It's, you know, what is it? The Greek calends, I think it's called. The Greek calends is something that never happens. Okay, I've discussed where I think is uh, the Eurozone is in terms of recovery very briefly and where I think the reform process might go, which is nowhere. But I'm, I'm generally, these are not judgments. The second is not a judgment. I feel passionate about it. 
Okay, let me talk to the real f about the real fun. Um, Brexit. Um, what's going to happen with Brexit? Um, I think I have about five minutes left. Ten minutes? I don't know. Uh, ten minutes. Okay. Um, well, the, th the negotiations have three main components. I, I'm assuming most of you all know this, so I apologize for repeating what you already know. Um, but there we are. So the first is how to handle the divorce. And there are three main issues there, which is money, how much do we owe? Secondly, how do we treat people, named particularly EU residents of EU, citizens of EU countries who are resident in the UK and vice versa. And third, what do we do about the island of Ireland, where we're about to reinstate a border which we very intelligently got rid of in, after the Good Friday Agreement. Um, then we have what we might call the transition, since nobody believes the long-term arrangement uh, of, of a free trade agreement, whatever that may take and contain, can be agreed in the next year, well, by March 2019, we have to have some transition on which there has been some progress. So the questions are, what do we do about the customs union, the single market and the movement of people in that transition? And then finally, what is uh, the post-Brexit long-term arrangement, which would be presumably negotiated after we actually have left. Um, so that's what, it, what the process we're going through. Uh, and at the moment, we're stuck on item one because the commission with, has, has followed its mandate, which says until there's sufficient progress on these issues, we can't go to any of the other issues. I think the position the Commission, the, 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 the Union has taken on this is completely reasonable. My, my friends at home, quote unquote friends, think that it is utterly unreasonable. In any case, we are completely stuck on money because the British don't want to indicate what they think they might owe. And we have no solution for Ireland of a permanent nature. Um, we could have a transitional solution by remaining the single market and customs union, but that's not going to be the dis position in the long term. The Prime Minister's made that clear unless she's got rid of and replaced by a completely implausible government, which doesn't exist. So Ireland is insoluble as things now stand. Obstacles, um, well, uh, Article 50 gives you two years. We've wasted six months of the two years. Um, we need really to get a deal if it's going to be economically relevant in the first half of next year, the chances of that are basically zero. And the reason we need it in the first half of next year is business has to plan. And to make serious plans, they need, uh, they need close to a year if they're moving lots of people, completely redesigning their businesses for a completely different arrangement. So they need to know where they'll be. And if they think we're going to crash out, they're going to make decisions in the early part of next year. Many have already, but they will make lots of decisions the early part of year on the assumption we're going to crash out. Um, and that has very large costs for us. Um, uh, it is remains one of the miracles of British incompetence, but I understand fully how we got here, that we decided to trigger Article 50, which gives us uh, two years before we'd actually decided what our negotiating position was on anything. That's a pretty strange way of proceeding. But uh, when you are, uh, um, well, I won't go further into this particular aspect of so many multiple madnesses. Um, uh, of course, negotiating uh, with the EU is always very difficult. It has many other priorities. There are 27 countries. There's the Commission. There's Parliament. Uh, and its, its negotiating demands are always the minimum demands of each of its members, and they can't be traded off easily. You can't trade off the interests of one country against the interests of other, because each country thinks they're incredibly important. So changing the EU's negotiation position is impossible, um, and the, the, the British aren't prepared and have no idea what they're doing, so we're getting effectively nowhere. As I understand it, the one important issue where most of the problems have been resolved is people most of the problems connected with how to treat people after we leave uh, have, I understand, now been resolved. Um, we have a huge political problem because, as I said, it doesn't know what it wants. 
It has a weak government which is internally divided and both of its main parties are completely split internally. The issues of money, treatment of people itself isn't problematic. The problem there is the role of the European Court of Justice in protecting the rights of people. That's a neurologic <laughs> issue. And Ireland, our Brexiters in government and in parliament regard, particularly on the right, regard compromise as treason and they want to blame failure on the EU. They expect failure and they want to blame it on the EU for its unreasonable approach. In other words, they're suicidal maniacs. The, uh, uh, and of course, there are EU hardliners too who want to punish the UK pour encourager les autres. In some negotiations are progressing about as badly as I expected it. Um, these negotiations are important to both sides, but as you'd expect, uh, um, uh, the uh, UK has a very weak position. Uh, um, uh, the, um, the share of our merchandise exports to the EU is 44%. Overall, about 40% of our trade goes to the EU, and that's a very large share of our GDP about seven or eight percent um, in goods alone, probably about 11, 12 in, if you include services. And if you invert it uh, and you treat the rest of EU as a single country, only seven percent of their, uh, uh, sorry, about 20 percent of their external exports and seven percent of their total exports, including internal trade, go to the UK. But the UK is the most important trading partner of the rest of the EU, uh, just slightly ahead of the US. So it is an important trading relationship for the EU. But of course, it's nothing like as important for the EU as it is for us. So we are in a very unbalanced position. I think there are four alternative outcomes. No deal. Um, uh, we will be at ground zero for trade policy. We would have an administrative and policy mess because the transition to WTO tariffs would be administratively very, very difficult. And it will be a disaster, I think. And I think that's a good 40% chance. I think at the moment I'd raise that. So I think it's the most likely outcome. The second item like outcome will be a deal on the divorce, less integration in the long-term future, details to be negotiated, but a transition with a customs union in a single market. This is sort of the Philip Hammond proposal. The pros of that will be very modest disruption. The cons of it will be it will delay the final decision, but that's inevitable, and the politics will be nasty. That seems to me almost as likely as the first. It's the one that the government would really like on a good day. Um, but it will mean giving a lot of money and they haven't got the backing yet to do that. Uh, a deal on divorce plus staying in the European economic area and customs union for the indefinite future, I essentially moving to becoming Norway um, inside the EU umbrella without being part of the EU. The pros will be no disruptions. I suspect that's politically impossible, but I put it down as 15%. Maybe it's less, 10%. It's a low possibility, but it would mean overthrowing the, the, uh, Lan uh, the Lancaster House commitments of Theresa May. And the final t possibility is that the whole system will look so colossally horrible that the British people decide in their wisdom that it's a great mistake, have another reference and agree it's a great mistake and stop the whole process and the EU accepts it. I think that's a pretty low probability. I think if I were a betting person now, uh, I increasingly think the first is the most likely. We won't have a deal. But the second is, the, is also the second. That's what we are really shooting for now. Um, now, I just want finally to say a little bit about the British economy and where we are in thinking about how bad this is for the UK. Well, uh, we're in a terrible state at the moment. First, we have no productivity growth and haven't had since 2007. In fact, we're right at the bottom of the G7 in productivity with Italy. Nobody really knows why, but it's the fact. Um, in terms of what the Brexit vote has done to the economy so far, this is quite, I think, quite a nice way of thinking about it. So this shows the successive average consensus forecast for 2016 output, 2017 and 2018. And the really interesting thing is 2017. Immediately after the vote, we the forecast has marked GDP growth down to half 6.6% on average. It's since creeped up and it now looks like ending at one and a half percent. 
So it's clearly a negative impact, but not as big as we thought. And if we go to 2018, the consensus is stuck at slightly below 1.5%, 1.3% consistently. So I think the reasonable view would be that the Brexit vote has knocked off about half a percentage point or so off growth um, in the short run. Uh, but not worse, not bad enough to change people's mind. And this is the same thing for inflation. And the crucial point here is we did have a collapse in sterling and it has led through to a very large and consistent rise in inflation expected to last through in 2018. And the uh, and uh, and it's eroding real incomes and real wages and real spending and it's making people very miserable again. But that's what you do. What happens if you do stupid things? In terms of the long run consequences, it's clearly going to be bad for the economy. I don't think there's any serious doubt. When we joined the EU, we had a very large increase. You can see it very clearly here in openness of our economy. And I think that clearly helped the performance of the economy in the last 35, 40 years. And we've become more open than ever before. Um, most estimates, this is an estimate by Monica Ebel, indicate that when we leave it's impossible to offset the impact of leaving if we go to WTO terms on our trade in goods and services. There will be a massive reductions in exports uh, of goods uh, and exports and imports trade on both sides in goods and services in the total if we leave for the EU. Even if we go to a, a normal free trade area, but not the single market, there will be big reductions. And signing free trade areas with other countries, even the US, will not make much difference. So we're going to have massive reductions in trade. I think that's certain, and that will have negative effects on GDP. The models that were done at the time of the referendum campaign by serious forecasters, the OECD, the Treasury, National Institute, the LSE, uh, all thought there will be not insignificant negative GDP effects in the short run and very varying views on the, the impact on the long run as trade become, as our trade shrank. The views on the short run effects, it looks at the moment as though the National Institute's guess that GDP levels will be about 2% below what we thought they would be before the referendum by 2020. So that's over four, over three years. That doesn't look a bad guess, somewhere between 1% and 2%. So two of these are not bad guesses of the short run effects. The Treasury was probably exaggerated in the OECD too. In terms of the long run effects, what's interesting is how widely divergent they are. I don't think anybody disagrees they'll be negative, but the scale of the negativity, we don't know. <laughs> Um, uh, this is the very final slide. So um, the, what's going to happen on Brexit? The EU economy is doing very well on employment and very badly on productivity. I haven't been shown the, but the employment figures, but we have pretty... No, I did show them earlier. Brexit is a big additional concern. I think it's very likely we'll have no agreement. Uh, um, but it is possible that we will exit from the single market and customs union in the long term, but we'll have a good transition and some sort of deal which won't, will minimize the trade damage. Trade def deals with the rest of the world will not and cannot offset the loss of market access to the EU. Uh, I think that's very clear. Uh, uh, Plausible assumptions for trend economic growth are somewhere between 1% and 2% a year. And unless productivity starts improving, and I see, can't see why that will happen during this process, it's closer to 1% than 2%, which is an extraordinarily low rate of growth for the UK, which still has relatively uh, dynamic do demographics, despite the, what will clearly be a decline in immigration. So I've covered what I think is going on in the Eurozone and I've covered what I think is going on in the UK and I've spoken too long, but there it is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I do think an excellent talk on two issues which are crucial going forward for Europe. If I might just summarize you both parts in three points. The first was you, you some, at some time said uh, Europe has been dealing quite successfully with the crisis, and you said it was mainly because the ECB did its job. One of the reasons. The biggest thing. This would be really con controversial in my home country. Yes, the biggest single reason. So, Athanasios. <laughs> 
So a good point to possibly to, uh, to discuss. You did not mention fiscal policy, probably because fiscal policy was not that much involved in terms of stabilizing the European economy or might have even been might have even been um, very much pro-cyclical, hence destabilizing. But I do think uh, one issue we might uh, discuss and talk about is all the institutional innovations which we have seen since 2012. That was the uh, European Stability Facility, which became permanent as an ESM. That was in particular the creation of the banking union, which was deemed to be a three-legged stool, supervision, restructuring, deposit insurance. Um, well, and thirdly, now what is going on in terms of the debate of uh, uh, suggestions uh, as they came from President Juncker in his State of the Union address in Strasbourg, as well as um, the, uh, the, uh, the ideas which have been expounded by President Macron in Athens and, and then later in, on in Sabon and how uh, the German government will respond to that. As concerns Brexit, you've been much more pessimistic, if I uh, uh, might say so. And it has to do mainly with three things. No negotiation position. Um, secondly, an environment of low productivity, not very much conducive to uh, medium-run growth perspectives. And uh, thirdly, uh, Art, you might correct me, uh, there was a, a, a debate in France about deglobalization. As a result of Brexit, now much less openness of the UK economy. Imports plus exports over GDP, going down, so just the opposite of what the, the, those in favor of Brexit, like Pat Minford and others, were hoping for. Um, was that a fair summary? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then I would like to open up to the audience. Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you very much for your speech. I have a question about Germany's policy on the Eurozone. You mentioned that uh, Germany has consistently opposed to the major proposals of the European Commission and France to strengthen the Eurozone based on a sort of moral argument that they don't want a fiscal transfer unit between responsible countries and irresponsible countries, although Germany has been the country that benefited most from a weak single currency. But are the, is that policy uh, sound and, and logical from a strictly financial and economical point of view? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you for your talk. Uh, you've given us a very full picture of what happened in the Eurozone crisis, but have said very little about how the decisions were made. Uh, and as you know, uh, Janis Varoufakis has written a book which purports to give a behind the scenes look at one aspect of this decision making process. One never knows how much to credit what Varoufakis says. Uh, but he paints a picture of Wolfgang Schäuble as the absolute tyrant of the Eurozone, uh, much more important than Mario Draghi in European Central Bank, for example. So I wonder if you agree with that uh, portrait. And second, if you think that the replacement of Schäuble by likely someone from the FTP uh, will make a dis uh, difference in the way the Eurozone is going. Do you want me to answer these two? Um, there are an enormous number of things I didn't cover in this talk, and for a more complete view of my views, than my book, though uh, obviously life has moved on uh, since, that, since then. I d just stress, I didn't go through this in detail, but I decided just, but I perhaps should have mentioned more items. You're absolutely right, there was a lot of institutional reform. Uh, the significance of the banking union we don't yet know, but it probably has strengthened the banking sector considerably. Uh, simply, uh, I think I did mention, I think the, the shift in supervision to Frankfurt is a big deal. In many countries, supervision by host authorities, by national authorities, has uh, quasi or act outright corrupt aspects. Uh, yeah. Italy is the country I know best, and it's pretty clear there are some very doubtful things going on there. So I think that's a very important thing. 
uh, the creation of the European Stability Mechanism was an important institution, though, of course, its main <coughs> role was to deal with the three smaller countries, not the, the big ones. And uh, it certainly couldn't deal with Italy, uh, and everybody knows it could. It might have been able to deal with Spain if the Spanish crisis had not been too severe. Um, so there's been big reform, but it goes nowhere near what the more ambitious views of what the European the Eurozone should be uh, about. Um, you've asked me whether the German position is reasonable or responsible, I think. Is responsible the word you used? Um, uh, in the past, I felt much more, as a British person, referring to anybody else as irresponsible has now become very difficult. But the, uh, the um, I think one can, I've been thinking about this for 20, 30 years, okay? Um, I, my view is and has always been, and I'm not saying I'm right, but I'm just saying what my view is that the currency union is a fundamentally flawed idea constitutionally. Not economic, I've no idea whether it, I can come to that in a second. And the problem with it constitutionally is that if you have in the modern world a monetary system without a state, uh, so the monetary system is multi-sovereign and the, uh, 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 but the, the responsible political authorities and nation states responsible to their electorates. You have no constitutionally empowered entity uh, accountable to and responsible for the whole. And that means that when the German elect when the German government and, and parliament say, you can't have our money, because it's our money, constitutionally, uh, raised from our people, except through formal processes we control explicitly and precisely. That seems to me a perfectly constitutionally reasonable position, because there is no higher entity which has that status entitled to directly tax. Uh, but the people, as I understand American constitutional history, and my understanding is pretty weak, but I read quite a little bit about the creation of the Constitution and Hamilton. That was one of the reasons to create a federal government, right? So this is a constitutional problem, and to not just an economic problem. And the Germans are right to say we need a different sort of... There's just limits to what we can do within this political economic setup uh, to provide the sort of centralized fiscal and fiscal type arrangements you want um, uh, because it's illegitimate. And my view is that this is correct. And that conclusion for this view was more broadly because the accountable entities were national and the system was supranational it wouldn't end up as a un, somewhat undemocratic monstrosity. And in crisis, this would tend to re, be divisive within Europe rather than uh, bringing Europe together. And I think that's happened. I think goodwill among European peoples has been diminished by this crisis, even though we've come through it. Um, but the conclusion I drew from this, uh, which I stuck with almost consistently, and I will tell you why I didn't, for the last 30 years is therefore it was a bad idea. Even if it could be made work economically, it's a constitutional monstrosity. Um, and of course, it becomes in practice more difficult to operate uh, if the countries are very different and therefore are likely to diverge very substantially and therefore issues connected to how you deal with insolvencies, how you deal with bank insolvencies and governance are more likely to erode. So the, the truth is, a, if they had turned the old D-mark into a euro or something like that, and it included Austria and the Benelux, this would not have been a problem. Nothing would have changed. You know, they're basically all parts of the German economy. 
But but of course, as soon as you get France and Italy and Spain and Greece and Cyprus, it changes. And I think it is a constitutional problem. So I've been with the German, my German friends back in the 90s, and very many friends who I just said, who, who argued that in order to make this work, you needed a, a, a true political federal union, were logically correct. Cool. What? Cool, actually. The yeah, cool. Yeah, the no, no, cool. the Chancellor, that was the German position. The French wanted to run it as an intergovernmental system, and they still do, Macron does, because, the, to, let me put it very bluntly, constitutional democracy is not a big concern of France, and never has been. <laughs> I'm, go, I'm prepared to go, you know, this is the point about these we great... We have French here. The, the, yes, yeah, it's <laughs> trying to be true. Yeah, I, I'm prepared to do so. They change constitutions the way other people change co- raincoats. <laughs> I, I might once calculated... <laughs> That France has been through 10 constitutions since 1789. I, maybe 11 or 12. Anyway, this is not an important... The point is France is a different... I mean, you're basically trying to create a currency union with very different countries. All this is very theoretical in a sense. But what it means is institutional arrangements in practice have to be ones that can operate politically within a framework of a, of a limited constitutional integration because that's not going to happen at least not tomorrow the day are half a century from now, I know maybe there will be a true United States of Europe and so I've tended to focus on the things that are needed to make the thing operate from day to day and I think uh, uh, they do need a European monetary fund if they don't want the IMF They have to have some mechanism to help countries in crisis. So some such entity will be needed with the institutional capacity. And I think having the IMF in the middle of the European Eurozone is ridiculous. I thought that throughout. I accepted it because there was no alternative. So they do need that. They need sufficient fiscal backstop to make the banking union work. We can disagree. There are people disagree, but I actually, I discussed this with Hans Helmut before, I'm one of the people who think that in our really serious banking crisis, you need a fiscal backstop. There are some people who think you can do it entirely by bailing in creditors, but in a first-class crisis, I think you need a fiscal back To need that, I think the idea of a fiscal stabilization mechanism at the Eurozone level is unworkable. It might be nice to have... But you really need a big thing to stabilize the whole thing. I don't think that can be possibly managed within any political sphere you can mention. You could imagine, and I think if you have an EMF, which is bigger than the present one, if you continue to operate the stabilization mechanisms of the ECB as through the target system, um, outright monetary transactions, the other things which weren't used but terrify the wits out of Germany, you can probably make this operate. And finally, which is the point I make again and again and again, um, so you don't have ongoing transfers, you have to have mechanisms of reasonably symmetrical adjustment. Uh, So if you hit, countries hit a crisis, to me, the great failure of the adjustment process is German inflation isn't 4%. It should be 4%. And the failure of adjustment is that it isn't 4%, because that's what should happen. Uh, um, uh, but basically you have to have mechanisms of adjustment at the moment they're very asymmetric is this enough to keep this going? yes is it enough to make it a really well functioning union? no is it better for countries to remain in? they mostly seem to think yes so my conclusion I'm sorry this is a very long reply is wasn't a great idea you are in it you have to make it work and it'll never be anything but very imperfect and that's life uh, and and Germany won't give much more than it is now giving in in this context. I, uh, you haven't commented on whether my assessment of the negotiation position of the new German government is correct, but I, implicitly I'm assuming you think I'm right. Um, then you asked about what difference will the removal of Schäuble... Um, Varoufakis, whom I know quite well, and is a very, very interesting, intelligent man who's usually wrong... Uh, um, <laughs> was completely correct Mm -hmm. in the negotiation over Greece. Schäuble was the crucial, well, actually Angela Merkel was the crucial player behind the scenes, Um, uh, because the ECB was out of it. The ECB, as I understand it, and from my conversations with the president, 
in various stages basically decided for political reasons that it couldn't really support Greece uh, and ex excluded it as you know from its programs and so that meant Greece was sui generis it was treated um, in a different way from the other countries and the ECB was more or less absent so effectively this became a intergovernmental decision-making on Greece. And in those decisions, uh, Schäuble was clearly primus inter pares with a very big M, capital P on the primus. Uh, the, um, uh, it's well known that the FTP remains convinced that uh, Greece should have been pushed out. So we must assume that if the FTP do hold the finance ministry in any future crisis, involving such a country, uh, they will try and push it out. My understanding, which may be incorrect, is that the person who decided in the end to keep it in, within the Eurozone, was Angela Merkel, not Schäuble, uh, who, who, along with many Germans, thought that it wouldn't be a bad idea to push Greece out, first for defining the limits of bad behavior from their perspective, and secondly, to warn others who are misbehaving. I wrote a column at the time when they were thinking this, and I still think it was one of the columns on this terribly messy subject I got right, saying that uh, they really had to understand that once it became really credible that countries could be thrown out, then crises could very easily become, very easily become completely unmanageable uh, in every other country. And therefore the costs of pushing Greece, costs of Brexit to the system could be very, very uh, high. So that's what I have to say on those two questions. Sorry, these are such long answers. So my question is on Brexit. Say the UK crashes out, there's no agreement. Uh, conceivably, then there would be a hard border on the Irish, yeah. the Irish border. How practical is that? And if, say, you couldn't practically create a hard border, could the porous nature of the border help ameliorate some of the impact on the UK economy by with the British firms operating in Northern Ireland and exporting to Europe uh, through Ireland. How much could that I think the, the, this is such a mess. Uh, I mean, the, you know, the, the one reason why we have to reach a deal is to solve this problem. There are a number of possible solutions, but they're all involved uh, um, very difficult decisions. So I think Britain can't really export through, Northern Ireland is very, very small. Uh, uh, um, and I don't think the EU would tolerate a border so porous that the UK could you know, start shipping stuff from the UK into Northern Ireland, then to Ireland, and then back. First of all, it's really a costly thing to do. It, 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 Ireland is in the wrong direction. And uh, uh, I mean, really, you know, people don't realize, I mean, tens of thousands of trucks go through Dover uh, a month. I mean, shipping, I mean, Britain is a mess, but it's still the, the world's sixth largest economy and we're dealing with the world's second largest economy this is a lot of trade so this can't be shipped through Ireland which is a wonderful place but it's really very small so it, it, it can't be done and, and without re-engineering the whole damn world uh, and and it has to go through containers then if the port arrangements which have to go through Rotterdam or the certain so it's a completely different trade structure and we are a part of supply chains, which are, when we, you know, there are stuff going out of England and back again on a daily basis. And this can't work that way. So it wouldn't really ameliorate it. The deeper question is the border. And it's a political and symbolic one. Of course, we could recreate the border. Physically, you can recreate a border. The trouble is, it will be a living and burning symbol of the division of Ireland. And that is an unresolved crisis in British history, going back. All right. Well, if you're really generous, 800 years, but let's leave aside the Henry II and all the rest of it. Just a last century. So that would be a burning problem. And the EU has resolved not to let that happen. But if they let us crash out, which is one reason they might give in, then that's what's going to happen. Now, in an agreed framework, in the long run, 
So assume the transition is what I like. We avoid the hard Brexit, which would be a big problem here. Um, there are two possible solutions to the Irish problem that are being proposed on the assumption we leave the customs union. We've left the customs union, so there has to be some sort of tariff border. In a free trade area, there's a tariff border merely to check rules of origin, that you fit with rules of origin. So one possibility is discussed is we don't have a border within Ireland, and we have a border between Northern Ireland and England and Scotland. Okay, so basically we agree with the EU that Northern Ireland remains in the EU, effectively, or at least the EU Customs Union, but England and Scotland doesn't. Um, I'd be perfectly happy with this, don't worry me. The Democratic Ulster Party, Democratic Unionist Party, would see this as the beginning of the unification of Ireland, which it probably would be, and they would go berserk and bring down our government. But it's a nice solution, and it will be a step towards the unification of Ireland, which I'm in favour of. But they, by the way, error really isn't very keen on. They, they talk about it, but you know, this is a pretty unpleasant thing to have to swallow. Very expensive and very grumpy. But the, but the, that's one possibility. Essentially, Northern Ireland leaves. Maybe it becomes a shared zone. Right? It's in the EU economically, but politically. Could that be work? Well, you can always be imaginative about small areas. Uh, the second thing, possibility, that is being discussed, which is what the British government wants, is to have a virtual border. So the idea is that we wouldn't police stuff going through. Uh, every consignment would be, you know, you'd, 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 if you're going to send goods across the border, you would um, report them electronically. You would get consignment numbers. They would be m supervised on a random basis, but not at the border itself. Uh, you'd say where things are going and what, they, what they're for. Uh, and the British government actually wants this to be for all our trade with the EU. So we would basically continue to have an administration-free zone with behind-the-border electronic checking. Nobody knows and many are skeptical about the feasibility of that. It will be a rev somewhat revolutionary development. But some people think that old-fashioned customs borders are just very old-fashioned and we should be able to police trade in a more modern way. Um, uh, and that, if we could get to that, which I'm very skeptical about, uh, then that would solve the problem of the hard physical border too. But at the moment, nobody knows what to do with this one. Okay, now, the unemployment rate in the UK, as in the US, may be relatively low, the official unemployment rate. But at the same time, wage growth is extremely low in both countries. That is correct. And it's been that way for many years now, and there doesn't seem to be a way out. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't propose any solutions in anything that you said. Per capita, GDP is fine, but it, this says nothing really about the distribution or, or, or the relative uh, you know, accessibility to, to large sectors of the population, to, to that GDP. So is there a solution to this? I would like to, it is important to know it's that, also yeah, Brit, yeah, I agree with that. But Britain and, one of the things people don't realize is that US history and British economic history of the last 30 years have been somewhat divergent. Uh, uh, so uh, America has had, um, on every measure, consistently rise, or more or less consistently rising inequality. There have been oscillations at the top associated with stock prices, leave that aside. And uh, stagnant real wages for a very large part, as I read it, I'm not an expert, uh, for a very large part of the American population for at least well over a generation. This hasn't been true in the UK. Inequality hasn't, on any me major measure, increased significantly since the early 90s. And uh, top incomes have increased a little, but all the overall genies haven't increased. And real wage increases up to 2007 across most of the income distribution were quite considerable. So what you think of as a, I'm not saying we aren't now there where you were 35, 40 years ago. That may well be true. We are maybe on that process. But the important thing about the last 10 years in the UK is that indeed 
over this period, real wages, real disposable incomes, and all the rest of that have been completely flat for individuals. Uh, uh, um, there's been rises in employment, that's pretty clear, constant real wages, that is pretty <laughs> clear. There haven't been dramatic in worsenings in unemployment, uh, worsening in distribution, income distribution. The crucial point is that's not surprising because productivity is completely flat. It's not that we've had, as you did, have had, say, the fat standard figures, rising productivity in the UK, all of the gains of which have gone to the top. There hasn't been any rise in productivity in the UK. So what we've been doing is sharing nothing. So what growth we've had is simply by in increasing the labor force, uh, participation rates and employment rates have got to very high levels. Um, and we've also youthened the labor force a bit by migration, which we're now stopping. So we have the same problem. We now have stagnant real incomes uh, across most of the distribution in the UK, as you seem to, but the, and wages are stagnant. Uh, but the big problem in the UK is this isn't because income distribution is getting worse. It's, the big problem in the UK is it's because the economy has ceased to grow. So we, a necessary condition for improving this, either we redistribute income, we could, we are a moderately unequal country. So m much less unequal than the US, but we are moderately unequal. We could redistribute, and that's clearly what Jeremy Corbyn wants to do. But in the end, over any reasonably long period, uh, you can't raise real incomes for a large part of the population uh, in a country which isn't extraordinarily unequal, and Britain is not a Latin American country or the US, <laughs> without raising productivity growth again. And that's our big dilemma. In the US, productivity growth has always so been very low in the last 10 years by historical standards, but nothing like as low as ours. So I would say that America's problems are more distributional and somewhat less productivity growth than ours. And our problems are mostly productivity growth and somewhat less distributional than yours. And in other words, our stories, our national stories, though there are similarities and the you know, the unhappiness, the deindustrialization, all that stuff is similar. But the economic stories are very different. And I, I constantly tell people that it's a very, very important, you know, all unhappy countries are unhappier in their own particular way. The, the, I do try to tell Americans that the American story of the last 35, 40 years is a very important story because it's the US, but it isn't a representative story. It's not what's happened in most other developed countries who also have large problems, but they're not the same problem. Let me give you one other example, one of my favorite statistics. I think I've got it here because it's so unbelievable to me. It's something, uh, wait a second, um, which I just, uh, look, okay. So this is divergence. Come on, come on, come and do your stuff. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. This is, this is, I find still absolutely participation rates, labor force participation rates, name the proportion of different po population in the labor force looking for work or having work. And this is for 25, 50 year old to 50 year old men and women in 2015, which is the large, last time. And in that, uh, uh, so in the UK, the participation rate, for, and they were most employed, for men and women was 86% in prime age. In Germany, was 88%. Do you know what it was in the US? No, no. No, no, this is, that, it's, this is just prime age men. It's prime age people, 25 to 55. Your figure is for all, for all people. So the primate, the 25 to 50 year olds, the people you expect to work, the US is 81%. So it is five percentage points below G UK and uh, seven percentage points below Germany. If you looked at those figures 10, 15, 20 years ago, just, they would have been the same. So there's a, so that's what I mean, special story. The labor market story in the US is sui generis. The only major country that is lower than the US in participation rate is Italy. And that's a, that's a national problem. That, we have different problems. That's all I'm trying to say. So thank you. Thank you for the lecture. Um, you mentioned Greece a couple of times in your presentation. Not much. Uh, not much, though, yeah. So, yeah. so 
I have a question about Greece because obviously the crisis has led to a lot of good debt. Um, yeah, yeah. Depressed economy, no industry whatsoever. Greece is too generous. And, um, and, and obviously no control over the monetary policy, so there's no way to inflate, inflate the debt away. So what do you think? The end game for Greece is, you know, five, ten years down the road. Like, you know, how would this story evolve? And is eurozone, in your view, um, sufficiently um, prepared institutionally to handle another case of, of Greece or, or whatever country that might be? I'll take the next question. Okay. Yeah. You, you uh, yeah. So actually, I was going to ask a reasonably similar question. You mentioned that um, the ECB's actions were a, a critical part of um, the crisis resolution. Um, uh, In my also, view. Uh, and, and, yeah, that's right. And, and you also mentioned that Germany would be against any major kind of fiscal backstop or, or transfer union and so on and so forth. So um, <coughs> how does the, uh, how does Europe deal, or how does the Eurozone deal with the next crisis? Given that monetary policy, um, especially given that the ECB have its own self-imposed constraints of you know not being able to buy more than 33% of, of any um, uh, country's debt, um, they um, seem, at least uh, for the moment, operating on the basis of the capital key framework. So I mean, that's a lot of tools that it's sort of effectively uh, constrained from using on the next crisis. So what happens in the next crisis? I, mean, how does, uh, I think that's a really good question, but I think it applies. Of course, it's extreme in the Eurozone, but I think it applies more generally. I mean, friends of mine like Larry Summers have been mainly wondering about what the US would do in the next crisis if it happened fairly soon if uh, the, the current monetary policy weren't even begun to be normalized and you had a very serious recession for whatever reason, what would actually happen? Um, so let me deal with the first one. Okay, this is the Eurozone story on Greece. <coughs> By the Eurozone story, I mean the sort of policymakers in charge view, which basically means German policymakers. So I will tell you what they, te what they say. Um, the debt stock, which is nearly all now owned to officials, mainly European government, is, uh, which is true, um, carries an extremely low interest rate, which is true, extremely low. So the debt service is very low. Uh, they can't write off the nominal headline. They, politically, they can't get away with it writing off the headline there. Uh, but the interest rates are so low that uh, either over the next, you know, Greece will start to pick up growth again. Um, might surprise us on the upside. Not completely impossible, though, I have to admit, unlikely. And given the extraordinarily low interest rates, the debt will slowly attenuate. Okay, and as long as interest rates in the eurozone in general remain very low, because the rates, particularly on ESM money, European Central Bank, depend on the rates for the eurozone governments, which are incredibly low, but uh, allow them to borrow at these incredibly low rates, then the on lending rates will remain very low. Essentially, pretty crudely. Greece can borrow as if it were Germany, which isn't a bad deal. And it's not really worth worrying about the debt. Now, forget about the headline numbers. It's not relevant because basically the debt service cost is next to zero. Very, so very, very low. Interest rates are very, very low. I can't remember what they are on average, but they are very low. So the rates of interest on it about Greek, one. But it about, one. about one. The rates of interest on Greek debt are way below those on Portuguese, Italian, Spanish. so it's a great deal. Step, don't share, worry about it. Share of GDP much lower. Than yes, GDP. yeah, exactly. So don't worry about it. Just forget it. The yeah. argument against that position, and that's their position, and they're not going to change it. So the policy won't change. That's clear. Uh, they're not going to write it down. They can conceal how little it costs because they don't mark to market or any of this in German public accounting. So. It's an interconcealed loss. I mean, it's implicit, and not even a loss in running terms. It's just they're passing on a subsidy in the case Greece actually does default. Uh, the argument against that is, well, at some point, you know, when the, Greek, the stock is still explosively large, 
the rates of interest will, might start normalizing, and then suddenly Greece will have to pay a lot. And then, and creditors know that could happen, so that makes it unwilling for other people to lend to Greece if it wants to get out of this. And furthermore, it makes Greece look like a basket case to any not very knowledgeable investor, so people aren't prepared to invest in this country, because they all think there's this huge shadow overhanging it. At some point, something's going to blow up with the debt. And therefore, the sensible thing to do is to write it off, because you're basically writing it off by providing it at zero interest terms. Just make it open, write it off, turn that subsidy into a present value, capitalize it over. This is clearly the sensible thing to do. Uh, but I'm told by all German politicians I've spoken to about this, and I've spoken to another, that the Bundestag would go hysterical and it can't be done. So those are the arguments. Uh, I, therefore, my view is capitalize the subsidy and realize it, even though it means committing to the future. Um, uh, but I don't think it's going to happen. So the Greeks will remain in this situation. Could they get rounded if interest rates remain low like this for the next 10 or 20 years, as they have in Japan? Yeah, in 10 or 20 years, look, for, after having collapsed the economy 75%, with moderately good policy, it does seem to me that a growth of 3% a year from now on in Greece shouldn't be impossible. And if that were possible, I'm not saying it is, then over 20 years, things would look very, very different. Now, is that possible? Yeah. Some people are optimistic about the next government. I have to say that I've got a bit pessimistic about Greece. But 10 years of reasonable policy making might make this look much better. But anyway, that's the situation. <coughs> on the next crisis, um, my view on the next crisis is what we will have to do in the, in the next about the next crisis is pray there isn't a next crisis, because uh, we don't have any we don't have any politically acceptable instruments. So, of course, we have instruments, um, but if there were a major crisis in any of our countries. Uh, <coughs> I'll leave aside where the U.S. with its with, but what they've done to the Fed and what it might be done by the next chairman and all such horrors. I'll leave that aside. But if you look at the eurozone, I'm assuming that it will be very difficult to get interest rates shorter unless there's something very extraordinary happens and blow out inflation or something, which seems very unlikely to me. That we're not going to get ECB rates above. Two to three percent, even three or four years from now, they'll have normalized the balance sheet a little, but it'll still remain pretty large. If it were a severe negative shock, then the only thing they could do is go back to QE uh, um, when long rates are still pretty low, and They'd have to go ultra negative on rates, which would be politically explosive because they'd have to start passing that on to households. And I think taxing households for their deposits would not be very popular in Germany either. Uh, and oh, I think actually technically possible. And fiscal policy is ruled out. You know, serious fiscal policy is ruled out. And the monetization of fiscal policy, which I'm wildly in favor of, is absolutely verboten. So uh, uh, I think in that situation, if it were to happen, I think they'd have an unmanageable crisis. But they've been more imaginative in the past than I thought they would be. I thought they were gone as five years ago. So maybe they'd invent some way around this rather than see it all collapse, because they're a technical way. You can always create demand if you want to, but you have to be very determined. Um, it's not difficult to create demand. You just have to use the fiscal and monetary systems together in a su sufficiently aggressive way. Would they do it? As the, ECB, as the Eurozone is now constituted, it would be impossible. In the US, they could do it trivially easily. They did it in World War II, but they'd have to have a government that's willing to do it. Um, could that happen? Yeah, in time. If the crash is big enough, you get FDR coming and somebody does something. Uh, but in the, uh, uh, I mean, in the end, a functioning democratic system will probably save itself. But the, let's come back to the constitutional point. Eurozone is a monetary system without a state. It therefore cannot, as a collective activity, be a functioning democratic system. In a first-rate crisis, it's a series of countries responsible to their electorates. How you handle that, we don't know. So the hope has to be 
that this, and it's not an insane hope, it may be a bit optimistic, that the scale of the crisis that occurred between 2007 and 2013 in the Eurozone, the two crises, <laughs> is a one-off. We have a better banking system than before, fundamentally better banking system than before. That's the optimistic view. Uh, the um, uh, debt is slow. Oops. Public debt is coming down. Private debt, in quite a few cases, is coming down, though it remains high, really quite high in some, but not in the biggest countries. Um, and so, this is, you know, this is one in, uh, the optimism. This is a once in an eighty-year crisis, not in a once in a decade. And the next one is, you know, like in 2007. The next one is in. 2020-70, and none of us need worry about that. But <laughs> I'm not completely optimistic about that, but that's the optimistic view. But if they had a really serious crisis in the next five years, really serious one, the system as it is now, I think, couldn't, couldn't cope. Well, you might have a war with Russia, and that would uh, change the constitutional system very quickly. <laughs> Not a rec policy recommendation, I should stress. <laughs> that, that, the, your last remark was very reassuring. Good. By the way. Good. Good. So you started off saying that you are exhausted, tired. Really exhausted. <laughs> I didn't have in any way the sentiment that you were, you were tremendously dynamic, and we are very grateful that you have made time for us. Thank you so much. It was excellent. <laughs>